one of the most exciting finds involves Cave 7. And, and if, if I were speaking to a Jewish audience in Jerusalem, you'd hear big groans right now. In Cave 7, we have different types of manuscripts. They're written on papyrus rather than the parchment, the sheepskin. And it is written in Greek, not the Hebrew or Paleo-Hebrew. Cave 7 has collapsed. Its uh, sides and roof have fallen away, and 19 small fragments of papyrus were found. And they couldn't read them initially, and then as they continued to study, oh yes, here is part of Exodus, and here is part of Jeremiah, and we can find that. And of course, with computer analysis, they can see how these letters would fit into a text. But they couldn't read the rest of them. 17 of the 19 fragments were unread. The reason was they had to find them in the Old Testament. Uh, and they weren't Old Testament. They were New Testament fragments. One of the most obvious is from Mark. And this particular fragment mentions uh, Gennesaret, which is a peculiar word for the Sea of Galilee used only in the first century. And so this helps date it together with the style of the letters. And this is a quotation from Mark 6, 52 and 53 that mentions Gennesaret. Now, the way you do this is you superimpose text over this and you see if it fits. And so even with just a few letters, uh, you can identify it. Well, you superimpose this text over it and you can see the top two words fit pretty well, but the rest of it doesn't work. Well, with computers, you can adjust the margins. And, of course, you don't know how wide the margins were and how uh, wide the columns were in which this was written, but when you adjust it, bingo. <laughs> it fits up and down and sideways with the word Gennesaret, that unique first, testament, uh, first century word right in the middle. This is Mark 6, 52 through 53. And as they continued to analyze it, they found several other passages from Mark and Acts and Romans and 1 Timothy and 2 Peter, which was one of the more controversial, and James, verified. And the real significance is this is necessarily before 68 A.D. when the Romans came in and destroyed all of this. The style of the letters indicates about 50 A.D. Now, that's probably when it was written, but it has to be before 68 A.D. Now, think about that. In Mark, style of the letters indicating about 50 A.D. Now, we have verified. Jesus says, you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And what happened in 70 A.D.? The Romans marched in, and the stones were thrown down, and here we see a first century street that's just pummeled by the stones that were tossed down in 70 A.D., and it was prophesied before 68 A.D., and we can prove it. You see why they don't like that <laughs> and why they don't want to admit there's New Testament. Now, the, the same process that allowed them to identify Ezekiel and Jeremiah in the papyrus from the Greek we used to find Mark, and uh, they accept one and not the other because it doesn't fit their theological views. This is ongoing. We have, we're finding more fragments, and you don't hear a lot about this either. They're papyrus fragments. Uh, maybe New Testament, more of it will be found. Well, they are fighting that tooth and toenail. Let's summarize with the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. First, they reveal a sect whose approach to Scripture and whose view of prophecy is exactly what you see in the early church. Not like the liberal view today, but like what we see revealed in the New Testament. As Paul said when he wrote this, uh, they received uh, it in Thessalonica as it was in truth the Word of God. As he told the people at Corinth, uh, if you're spiritual, you accept this as the commandments of the Lord. This is the way they viewed Scripture, which is unique from what's taught in the universities today. It destroys the idea that the beliefs of the New Testament were developed over hundreds of years after Christ died and after the apostles had died and this, this 
tradition, this myth grew. No, they, that's, that's not the case at all. Like John the Baptist, they believed they were in the desert as forerunners, and they would refer to the passages which referred to John the Baptist and apply it to themselves. But they saw that as preparation for the coming Messiah and believed it was imminent, that it was time, the time was fulfilled, as John the Baptist preached. Like Jesus and the apostles, they believed they were living in the last days of the Old Testament era and that the Scriptures very definitely promised the coming Messiah and a Messiah that was a suffering Messiah and one that would be resurrected. The apostles didn't get that during the lifetime of Christ. Finally, when the Holy Spirit came, they did, but these people understood it ahead of time. One of the lessons that we learn is the meticulous view with, by which these scriptures were copied, the accuracy of the transmission. Interestingly, Josephus, or Josephus as they call him, uh, comments on this. He says, we've been given practical proof of our reverence for our own scriptures, for uh, although such long ages have now passed, no one has ventured either to add, to remove, to alter a syllable, and it is an intrins intrinsic with every Jew from the day of his birth to regard them as the decrees of God, to abide by them as need be cheerfully die for them. And that's reflected in the processes of copying that we see in the records, in the manual of discipline, and in the artifacts that have been excavated. They counted every letter after they finished copying a page. They counted sideways, and they counted upside down, and uh, across, and if the tally did not match, they threw it away and started over. So it wasn't just copying and hopefully they got it right. They had ways to check. And as we suggested, every book of the Old Testament is written, and we have now with this manuscripts a thousand years older than any manuscript that existed before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The oldest that we had before they were discovered, was the Aleppo Codex. This was the Masoretic text that dated to 900 A.D., talking about Old Testament text. That's, when the King James was translated, that's the best we could do. And up until the 40s, that's the, the best man. Well, that, th this is 2,000 years after these prophets were talking. Well over 1,000 years. Uh, and all of this copying for a thousand years has to produce some changes. It couldn't be like the original. Well, now then we have the Isaiah scroll a thousand years earlier, and so we can check. What happened over the thousand years that intervened between the oldest in 1940 and the oldest then in 1950? A thousand years earlier. Well, they compare perfectly identical, word for word, in more than 95% of the text, and that 5% involves obvious slips of the pen and misspellings. There is no significant difference at all, and it is one scroll from beginning to end. While all of these years of copying have to produce changes, not so. When we understand the way they did it, the way they counted the letters, and then when we compare what was a thousand years earlier from the oldest, it's perfect. And that is just no longer a reasonable charge. It ain't so. When we look at the, the youngest Old Testament book, scholars will differ, but conservatively, the one that was written latest is about 325 before Christ, B.C. The oldest Dead Sea Scroll was written 300 years before Christ. We've got about 25 years separating the original. Now, Wikipedia, as I suggested, said that oldest Dead Sea Scroll was 325. Well, certainly less than a generation removed from the original we have copies today. Now, some will say, well, why don't you have the original? You can go back within 25 years. Well, we know what happened to relics 
like that brazen serpent that they had to destroy because the people were worshiping it. We see what our Catholic friends do today to claim the relics, splinters of the cross. There's enough of them around to build this building out of. Uh, that is forestalled by we don't have the original. But we have what goes right back to it. And if you have less than a generation removed from the original, the, the generation closest to the original, and you know you don't worry about a thousand years, you, it's, how reasonable it is it to worry about the 25 years closest to the original. If you are determined to disbelieve, you have an excuse. I think God does that to those that are not honest. But to honest, reasonable people, it's not reasonable to think that this is not like the original. We can get within uh, less than a generation. And then with the New Testament, we have that which was written, we know, during the lifetime of the eyewitnesses who saw the crucifixion, who saw these events take place. It was written then, probably about 50 A.D., before prophecies uh, of events that occurred in 70 A.D. And we can prove that. Now that's significant. Our text is dependable. Our view of prophecy is not something that's a spin hundreds of years later, but was inferred directly from the New Testament even before Christ, the Old Testament even before Christ. And the New Testament was written during the lifetime of the people who saw it. We have dependable text. And it's not reasonable to think otherwise. And therefore we conclude just exactly what Isaiah concludes as inspiration from God. The grass withers, the flower fades. Everything around us goes downhill, but there's an exception. And it has to be a supernatural exception. And it is by God's promise that the word of God stands forever. And we can defend that proposition and show that it's unreasonable to deny it.